Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. A while back, we did a video in our 10 Flaw series by looking at Imperial Class Star Destroyers, the most iconic ship in the Imperial Navy and an integral part of the Tarkin Doctrine. Now, we recognize that the Imperial Class Star Destroyer was a force to be reckoned with, and in a good old-fashioned broadside versus broadside fight, it'll probably destroy most ships. But there are actually several flaws in the design philosophy of this ship and how the Imperial Navy utilized it. If you want to know more about our thoughts on the problems with the ISD, check out this link right here. Anyway, today we're going to continue that discussion by talking about one of the ISD's predecessors, the Republic Benator class Star Destroyer. While much older, smaller, and lacking the same fleet-destroying firepower that the ISD had, the Venator-class Star Destroyer was smarter, had a more efficient design, and if utilized in the right way, was a lot deadlier as well. Or at least that's what we think. In this video, we'll be looking at 10 features of the Venator-class Star Destroyer that makes it one of the best designed ships in the Star Wars galaxy. Before good old Palby McScrotum Face and Will Huff, I'm compensating for a small penis Tarkin, took over Imperial Navy Doctrine, the Vendor Clan Star Destroyer had more than enough firepower for your average ship of the line. As a matter of fact, Imperial and First Order ships were always kind of on the extreme side of ship design if you take a look at galactic history as a whole. Their ships always focused on massive batteries of turbo lasers for close range broadside exchanges, which really does go against modern naval doctrine. Most naval tacticians understood that when ships got close enough to exchange barrages of close range turbo laser fire, no one actually won. Even the best deflector shields will fail in this kind of situation and the battle just becomes one of attrition. A victory is really not that great of a victory if you lose half of your ships. The Venator class Star Destroyer, on the other hand, was, well... An elegant weapon for a more civilized age. Although the Venator did have turbo lasers and frequently used them, I'd argue that the design choices of the ship placed them in a secondary role. The Venator featured eight DBY-827 heavy turbo laser turrets for close range slugouts with other capital ships. The DBY-827 was a very versatile firing platform. It had an interesting setting which fired two staggered projectiles. The idea was the first projectile would take out the shield and the second one following right behind it would take out the whole of a ship. The DBY-827 could also be adjusted from low to high power, which affected firing rate. At a lower setting, the turbo lasers actually functioned more like a flat gun against enemy fighters. The firepower of a Venator-class Star Destroyer was comparable to a later model like the Victory. But it was heavily outgunned by the Imperial-class Star Destroyer, which had 60 turbo lasers and 60 ion cannons. The First Order Resurgence had an even more ridiculous number of weapons and placements with 1,500 different types of lasers. Now, having more isn't always a better thing. For one, the more weapons and placements that are firing, the larger drain on the ship's reactor, which took energy from other crucial systems like shields and thrusters. While the Venator class was considered a Star Destroyer technically, it also had a secondary function as a carrier. And I argue that the Venator was as much of a carrier as it was a Star Destroyer, if not more. That's because the Venator class Star Destroyer was equipped with a ridiculous amount of fighters, including 192 Alpha 3 Nimbus class V-Wings or V-19 Torn Starfighters, 36 ARC-170 Long Range Recon Starfighters, and another 192 ETA-2 Actus class Interceptors. That's 416 Starfighters in total. That's almost 10 times more fighters than the Quasar Fire class carrier held, six times more than the Imperial class Star Destroyer had. And these weren't just short range TIE fighters, a lot of them had anti-capital ship capabilities. The ARC 170s, for instance, were shielded hyperdrive equipped capital ship killers armed to the teeth with proton torpedoes. The V-19 Torn also was heavily armed and carried concussion missiles. These were serious snub fighters designed not just for dogfighting, but taking out larger ships. Considering how much damage the Rebel Alliance was able to do with some X-Wings and some Clone Arrow Y-Wings, a Star Destroyer equipped with 416 Starfighters is no joke. And although not every one of these Starfighters aboard the Venator had hyperdrives, they could all be paired with hyperdrive rings, which is something that the TIE Fighters couldn't really do. So what are the benefits of having Starfighters with hyperdrives besides doing slash and run attacks from hyperspace? Well, it means that when your fleet arrives in system, all your starfighters can also simultaneously arrive without having to wait to be deployed from a carrier. So while the Imperial class Star Destroyer is still scrambling TIE fighters to supplement its notoriously weak point defense system, your hyperdrive equipped starfighters are already making their first attack run. And that first attack run might be enough to severely damage that ship. And that was basically the strategy for the Venator class Star Destroyer, and that was deploy your units early and deploy them from far away and keep outside of the range of your enemy while your own starfighters are taking pieces and chunks out of their armor. 
It was the same exact strategy that led to aircraft carriers replacing battleships as the core of naval fleets in World War II. And now, 70 years later, there are almost no active battleships left in the world. Except for the occasional ones floating inside of toilets in the ladies' room. Damn! You saved my battleship! One of the biggest problems with having so many ships on board is figuring out how to launch them all at the same time and as fast as possible. A modern aircraft carrier can launch about two or three jets every minute. Now, obviously, in Star Wars, there is no need to attach fighters to a steam catapult to assist takeoff, so the process is a bit quicker and safer. But having just one hangar door like the ISD has would have severely limited the amount of fighters the ship could deploy at one time. And for all you PC builders out there, you guys know that no matter how fast your video card is, if your old-fashioned hard drive that spins can't read data fast enough, it's going to bottleneck the entire system. The Founder class had a remarkably simple solution to preventing bottlenecking. A half a kilometer long flight deck that ran through the middle of the entire ship, along with a retractable hangar door of the same size. This design does sacrifice hull integrity for maximum fighter launch and retrieval ability. This is just another reason why I think the Vanderbilt class Star Destroyer is a carrier, because this is not the type of design you'll see on a normal battleship. Imperial and First Order ships to a lesser extent always had one huge flaw, a lack of point defense weapons. The Tarkin Doctrine focused on large ships with large weapons and other self-confidence building measures. Therefore, deterring enemy starfighters was the job of the TIE Fighter. Despite the high level training given to their pilots, the TIE Fighters were almost built as an afterthought. We break down their main flaws in another video, but the point is that their main duties focused on defending capital ships from enemy fighters. It was basically the only thing that the TIE in space superiority fighter was good at, and let's be honest, it wasn't even that good at it in the first place. It was completely outclassed by Rebel Stump Fighters. The Vanguard class Star Destroyer not only had a huge complement of fighters that could obviously screen it from other fighters, it also had 52 point defense emplacements. This was especially important when facing the Separatist Navy and their huge number of droid starfighters. In comparison, the Imperial class Star Destroyer had zero point defense designated turrets. The First Order Manator 4 class Siege Dreadnought was seven times as long as the Venator and had only 26 point defense turrets, which is exactly half of what the Venator has. And those turrets weren't even that good at hitting starfighters. On one occasion, Poe Dameron was able to take out every one of those turrets with just one X-Wing. The Venator class Star Destroyer had so many starfighters that the ship featured a unique dual bridge design. One of the bridges served as Starfighter Command. They were in charge of everything Starfighter related on the ship. This meant uh, coordinating new missions along with coordinating all of the traffic around the massive hangar door. Having a second bridge was also a good redundancy measure. It's too late! Run for it! In case the first one was destroyed and the ship was in, say, a gravity well of a giant space station. It's been a long <laughs> Separating the Starfighter Command from the Command Bridge also allowed both crews to be more focused on their own tasks, leading to more efficient battle commands. Along with a huge amount of Starfighters on board, the Venator class Star Destroyer also carried 2,000 clone troopers along with 40 LAAT gunships and several ATTE. Supported by several wings of Starfighters, the Venator class had a formidable invasion force all on its own. And not only could a Venator class Star Destroyer support its forces from orbit, it could also enter our atmosphere and even land. Which is quite impressive for a starship measuring over one kilometer long. The Imperial class Star Destroyer had the ability to fly an atmosphere, but it was structurally too weak to land. And because of that, when it was resupplying an atmosphere, the ISD relied on smaller craft to shuttle personnel, equipment, and material back and forth. The Venator being able to land directly on the ground made the loading process much easier. It could also be repaired in traditional dry docks planet side instead of in orbital shipyards. The Venator class was a very versatile ship that was of medium size. It was light and powerful enough to take part in atmosphere missions, which actually makes orbital bombardment more effective because turbo lasers were dissipated by thick atmosphere. The Venator was also powerful and light enough to pursue blockade runners, and at the same time, large enough to hold its own against Separatist dreadnoughts twice its size. It could also serve as a command ship for a smaller fleet. The Venator was a practical ship that wasn't large and sexy and armed to the teeth like the ISD. It was designed by rationally minded individuals who understood that fighting power and brute strength weren't the only thing that won battles. 
Having efficient systems and equipment along with robust logistics were just as important. And the Bounder class Star Destroyer was an incredibly efficient vessel at 59 million credits. It was almost a third of the price of the ISD at 150 million credits. The Imperial Star Destroyer took up a bulk of the Empire's military budget and was considered incredibly resource intensive. And if we compare these ships side by side, I'd rather take three or two Benator class Star Destroyers rather than just one ISD. By the time of the Clone Wars, the Republic had been around for tens of thousands of years. Despite being a bureaucratic mess, its military mind still understood the fundamental problems with governing an entire galaxy. Simply put, it was too much territory. So instead of focusing on pure firepower, the Republic Navy put an emphasis on efficient and cost-effective ships, whose range were further extended by a huge complement of fighters. In the Republic, only gigantic dreadnoughts really had more focus on direct fire capabilities, and these were mainly stationed in the core of the galaxy. Now, after doing three videos claiming that Republic designed vehicles are the best in their class, some people might say I'm a Republic fanboy. Well, I might be a bit biased because the prequels were what I grew up with, but I think my assessments are fair. It's clear that the weapons and vehicles of this era are more thought out and more modern, simply because it was created at a later date when compared to the original trilogy. Also, the Empire was heavily influenced by that moron Tarkin, whose doctrine single-handedly endangered the entire Empire through its stupidity. So guys, that's our analysis of the Venator class Star Destroyer. Let me know in the comment section below if you agree. Is it actually better than the ISD? I think in a one-on-one -on -one situation, it's kind of close, but overall, I'd rather have a fleet of Venator class Star Destroyers because of that flexibility and all the starfighters they have on board. Anyway, guys, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.